Welcome all to a new episode of the Fireborn Collection. For this episode, well, uh, we're doing Porter. Yeah. If you don't like him, you're a bitch. Now, I already know a good chunk of you most likely wondering why make Porter of all characters, considering he only appeared in his premiere episode and then occasionally just in the background of some episodes with very few speaking lines, and then just fell out the face of the earth when the reboot began. To put it simply, I just find the character interesting. His cool basis is an interesting way it was introduced in his premiere episode, season 18, and it's also where my name comes from from my YouTube channel. The Porter part in Fire Porter partially comes from this random Thomas character that hardly anyone remembers. But enough praising this absolute chat of a side character that's very underrated, Let's dive into my alternate universe take for Porter the Dark Side Shunter. Nineteen twenty-five was when Porter emerged from the works and began working life as the one of the shunters for the Dockyard Railroad, which is owned and operated by the Big City Railroad in America. Porter worked alongside the likes of Puffa and Little Owl at the Big City Port, shoving around trains and unloading ships. You know, the usual. Dockside Shunter lingo. That was until 1942 when Porter was shipped overseas to help out in World War II. By the end of the war, he was sold to British Railways from the War Department and stationed at Naffer Harbor, Sodor Soldiers Port in SAU. Porter remained in his Dockyard Railroad colors during this time with British Railways, the livery being a black base livery with yellow lining. That was until 1968 when the railways of Sodor gained independence from British Railways, and most of them were repainting their engines out of BR's liveries to further signify their separation. During this time, Porter requested to be repainted into a quote-unquote bright festive color in his words, and the Naffer Harbor Board agreed, and had him repainted into a pale yet somewhat bright green livery, which he still wears today. In present day, Porter is still the dockside hunter at Naffer Harbor and works alongside Salty. Was a pretty easy model to complete. He is an AHM 060 repainted into a new livery. Like all my other models, the painting process began by brushing on a gray acrylic as the primer. Usually, I do a couple coats to make sure that the new color shows up just right. Once the primer was dry, I began applying the body color. The exact color I couldn't find in stores or online, so I took a dark green, which I'll put on screen now if I find it, and mixed in some gray with a little bit of white to get the exact shade I was looking for. I used the Trackmaster Porter as a guide when creating this color, as I prefer a more vibrant color rather than the mutedness of Porter's livery in the show. After the main paint job was done, I went back and touched up a few areas in a black acrylic. After touching up the in black, I went back with some paint pens and lined out a lot of the details, these being the smoke box hinges, boiler bands, handrails, running board, etc. Then after that, I glued in some British style cupping loops so we can use the British rolling stock, and boom! Porter was complete. Porter, in the grand scheme of things, may be a pretty obscure character, but still my favorites. I think he's kind of underrated in my opinion, and I'm so glad to have him in my collection finally. He's kind of the namesake for my channel, if you will. Thank you all for watching this episode of the Fireboard Collection, and I'll see you all in the next one. We are back with more Portiverse lore ramblings. Oh yeah, this is episode 7. Here we go. Number 1. Steven is actually not the original rocket locomotive that currently resides at York. The Steven that we are familiar with is actually the engine that was from the 1920s Buster Keaton film Our Hospitality. After the film's release, it is unknown where this replica of you went. 
But regardless, it managed to surface for long enough in the early 70s for Robert Norby to come along and purchase it for the Offset Castle Railway. And Stephen was thrilled to start to work in order just in time for the railway's opening in 1974, where he still works today. Pretty cool. Number 2. Thomas, the tank engine, and Box Hill are actually really good friends. But how, you may ask, when Thomas never worked on the LBSCR in the Portiverse? Allow me to explain. So, in 1912, the Nafford Ulster Rail was greatly expanding and became the Nafford, Arlesborough, and Ulster Railway. And so, the KNUR and the LBSCR shook up a deal that saw an engine and a handful of rolling stock be brought over on a multi year loan deal for construction. And Boxer was the engine in question, and Boxer remained on Sodor before returning to the mainland in around 1923 before grouping. And it was around this time they got to know Thomas and become good friends. And fast forward to around 1960, and a rail tour set the travel through Sodor, and it was confirmed that a Terrier class would be pulling this rail tour. And you can imagine Thomas getting excited, as he might see his good old friend Box Hill again after nearly 40 years. You can imagine his utter disappointment when Stepney, a completely different Terrier, showed up instead. And thus the events of Thomas and Stephanie unfold for the most part as it does in the TV series. But Thomas would see Box Hill again at the big railway gala in York in 1991, after nearly 70 years. They did a lot of catching up either, that's it at least. Number 3. The Flying Scotsman will visit sort of frequently while in preservation. And these visits really kicked up in frequency in the 2010s, and he most often visits the Ulfstead Castle Railway whenever he's on Sodor. But he always makes sure to catch up with his brother Gordon whenever he visits. And for those wondering, he remains in his Eleni or Apple Green livery with two tenders. Because we are green son! Number 4. Mr. Jelly's Chocolate Factory resides on the Peel Gadget branch line. North of Kronk to be exact, and it lies at the bottom of a hill. And it first opened with the branch line in 1925. Percy will end up crashing into it in 1953 with his infamous chocolate crunch accident. And that will cause the factory to close for a good few years. But it would reopen in 1969, with an even bigger factory than before, which still sees regular rail traffic to this very day. Number 5. Rebecca was built in 1947 and was placed on the northwestern region of British Railways, where she often hauled commuter services. But in 1965, she collided with another commuter train caused by a points failure. And a few people sadly perished in this accident, including Rebecca's crew and Rebecca herself, sadly. A memorial plaque was placed at the collision site and is dedicated to her and those who perished that night. Number 6. Bo, yes, that Bo that Bachman is making out of nowhere, actually worked on the Big City Railroad for a decent bit, hence why he has buffers. And he's drawn around 1900 or so, and he actually managed to survive long enough to become a static display at the Ulfstead Castle Railway. That's, That's right. right. Our good old friend Sir Robert normally managed to scoop up Bo for his Castle Railway, and Bo still resides at the castle to this very day. Number 7. Our Percy that we know and love came about in 1926. It was in this year that several of the mainland engines went on strike, as it demanded a new shunter be placed at Naffer Station for their coaches. Tom had the first, acts accordingly, and he manages to get a copy of an old saddle tank engine from the Robert Heath Sons and Company, specifically the number 6 engine. He modifies the blueprints designed to have a bunker on the back for longer journeys, and after a few months of built construction, Percy emerged from the works and became the Nafford pilot. In 1955, Duck took over this process, and Percy was promoted to the Ulfstead branch line with Tom and Toby, where he still works today. Thank you all very much for watching. And I will see you all in the next one. Finally return to regular programming once again. Thank you for all the support for all the, all the marathon videos. Really appreciate it. I really wanted to put out videos during those three weeks. But a kid named High School Final Exams kind of got away with, away with that. So I need to put something out while I was testing those during that time. And so I figured those marathons would be a good segue into what I like to call phase two of my content if you will. A lot of new stuff's on the way, new series, some slight updates to other series as well. And we're going to be starting out phase two, sort of, with the Port of his Workbench installments, uh, focusing on the one and only Molly. And so here we go. After years of anticipation, dreaming, and waiting, Molly the Yellow Engine has finally arrived in my collection. You're probably wondering why. <laughs> why make Molly, who was in one episode as a lead and appeared in a few episodes as a background character, 
and I'm basically never seen again after a season or two. Well, to put it simply, she was a favorite of mine when in, during my childhood. For some reason, I remember loving this character as a kid. I even on the track of my summer only when I was little, play with that thing all the time. Yellow was also my favorite color at the time. I was like five or six at the time. And thus, I magically just gravitated towards Molly. And also, I remember that Whistle Memory game on the old Thomas website. And Molly was amongst the big three at Thomas, Percy, and James. She was even also in a bunch of the bath toys packs that were grouped in with the mains as well. Molly was there too. And a bunch of others. It's kind of like to believe that Molly was pretty hyped to be a potential new lead character for Thomas. Not only did she stand out visually, there was also a lot of potential there for a character. And also a gender balance, you know, that was starting to become a thing. But yeah, anyway. So yeah, I don't know why they never made her a lead. A lot of potential. And so that's why I incorporated Molly into the Portiverse, which is my personal headcanon. Speaking of which, let's get into Molly's backstory in the Portiverse. Molly was built in 1913 at Stratford Works like the rest of her class, and she was an extra member of the class built. And she was built as a special order placed by the newly formed Nafford Allsbrook and Ulster Railway the year before. After construction was completed, Molly was shipped over to Sodor, and she became the first ever express engine on the KANUR and the first express engine on the east coast of Sodor. Molly was also painted into a very unique livery as well. This being a bright yellow with white wheels at that time. Very, very flashy indeed. And she was eventually given black wheels when she was sent over for an overhaul in 1933. This was when she was rebuilt into a D16. And over time, Molly gradually became a secondary express engine whenever Gordon was out of action. She also did a lot of freight service at her time as well. And Molly was the very first engine to request a repaint. As she, as she pretty much hated her British Railway's livery. And thus, Muller was repainted back into her iconic yellow livery, as that is depicted on the model. In present day, Muller is preserved as the last D16 around, having a mixture of passenger and freight services for the Northwestern Railway. Molly was one of the very first engines on my build list when I first started modeling back in 2021. I knew pretty much right away that a D16 would be the base model for this. After winning the bid, I waited a couple weeks for the model to arrive, and the day finally came. Now it was time to paint her up into our iconic yellow livery. But yeah, usually the gray primer would take about two coats being brushed on. So after all that drying, I went nuts with the yellow paint. The color is quite simply apple barrel yellow. Straight up yellow. After the yellow was fully applied and dried, I did a lot of touch up work in black acrylic. After all that was the lining. I used a red paint pan and very carefully went on the indented lining on the boiler, cab and tender. After all that lining, I made out the front of Swimbox door in silver sharpie. And also blocked the number board as it had a British Railways number on it. A white paint pen was used for uh, these weird top things in a tender, and it was like on Molly's TV series model, so I just carried it over. After all the painting was done, I gave the model a matte clear coat. And the final step was to paint this hot rods red, with the red paint pen. And then of course, give her my signature staple sort of elements, the tuck style megaphone. And just like that, Molly was done. This will be the part of the video where I showed the model running around and stuff. But you know what sucks? Apparently, um, the, so the model worked before I painted it. But when I tested it afterwards, when I was done, it didn't work. After investigating, I found out one of the wires in the pickups that came loose. You, you, can, you can probably hear the immense pain in my voice just saying that. Yeah, this was, um... Not fun to uh, find out. But yeah, rest assured that one day I will get Molly running again. What that involves, I don't know. New chassis, bunch of wire surgery, who knows. I will, one more words, I will one day get this model Molly running again.
Molly is one of my favorite engines in the Thomas universe. Not only for nostalgia reasons, but also her hidden potential with the within. I will be holding on to the rest of my days. And like many others in this collection, she's easily one of my favorites. Top three there, I say? Yeah, definitely top three. Thank you all very much for watching this episode of Portiverse Workbench. And I will see you all in the next one. Welcome all to the Portiverse Workbench once again. And for the first time in the new year of 2023. Woo! For today's episode, we're we'll focusing on a remnant of Deo Thomas events. A dummy unit. Why is the example the way it is? Well, as we're going to the backstory of this dude in the Portiverse. Here we go. Around the 1990s or so, they had what time was eventually going to pop up across the world more and more frequently, and many railways began either converting existing engines to look like Thomas, or just buying slash building dummy units. Some looking out better than others. This example here shown in my model is one that was built rather cheaply, as it was only had four wheels and it was a lot smaller. Not much is really known about this exact engine other than it was on a United States railroad for some time until around 2003 when it was left abandoned. Meanwhile, the real Thomas began hauling rail tours across the United States starting in 1999, visiting the Strasburg Railroad among other railways. In around 2005, on, on his other tours, Thomas would bump into one of these dummy units and become rather surprised with them as prior to that point, he had no idea they existed. He was still kind of like cool with it, as you know, marketability and everything. And he got used to it over time, especially after running into more along the way. Not much is known about the fate of this dude or his whereabouts currently in 2023. So that's kind of where the story ends. The trail goes cold. While the trail goes cold on a backstory, the model story is a whole other level. So this was made from an all-engine scope push-along Thomas that was modified to fit on an 040 chassis I had. The chassis being heavily cut down, of course. So I took the Thomas toy apart and I stripped the paint by submerging the body in acetone overnight. I would recommend only doing this with metal materials as, as acetone can sometimes melt plastic. I've seen it melt Legos before, it's kind of creepy looking. So yeah, after submerging overnight in acetone, I had to take out the metal body and I scraped it with a metal wire brush to get all the paint off. Once that was done, I washed it off with some soap and water just to make sure it was extra clean. And then I primed the boy with some primer. White primer to be exact. Any brand works really. Then after letting that dry overnight, I began doing a hydro dip on this. It's very simple, you just take a bucket of water and spray it on top of the surface. As the whatever pattern like floats on the surface, you can slowly dip anything into it and it'll replicate the pattern onto the whatever you're hydro dipping, you know? That's what I did with the body. This was my first time doing a hydro dip on anything, so it looks kind of rough here. But I figured since it is meant to be an abandoned engine, it kind of works. Think of it as graffiti. So yeah, after hydro dimming the body, I let it dry overnight again. And while that was drying, I began doing all chassis work. I had to cut it down and remove the motor. Motor was gigantic, I gotta tell you. And then I had to remove all the gears inside and all that stuff to make sure the engine free rolled smoothly. As th there's no motor in this engine, sadly. And then I took a blue paint pen to the wheels to make them blue to match. Well, sort of match, but you know. And then I repainted the, um, the toy smoke box black as the toy I got was originally like a sparkly blue. And then I also repainted the whistles gold as they're just yellow and I wanted a more realistic whistle. I then took a black paint pen and painted the top of the running board black to match the railway series a bit. And then I took a hot glue gun and then I mounted the chassis. But then afterwards, I took the, the tip of the hot glue gun using the heat and I melted down the face's nose. And then I made a huge melt mark you can see on the left side of him. So I can make it look like it was abandoned and like worn down over time, you know? And then after a coat of matte clear, he was done. Well, I also forgot to mention, I drew on some number ones with gold paint pen. Just to make sure you know who it is. That was my abandoned Dale Thomas dummy unit. But we are not done here. We still have some more bench updates. So, if you remember seeing a community post a while back, you'll see that I made Spongebob's house in HO00 scale. Well, that's not the last of it. I've also made Squidward's house from the same guy who made the prints. So I'll put a link in the description so I can find the print. 
If it was wondering, yes, I do plan to make Patrick's house. Just need to finish him up. He is almost done, I promise. So, yeah. That's kind of whole Portover's workbench as it is currently. Thank you all very much for watching. The Creator Craft SP Aquatic Arc is in the works, so stay tuned for that. And I will see you all in the next video. Portaverse Lore Rambling Season 2 has arrived at long last. In this new season, the episodes will be a little bit longer. Instead of 7 bits of information, this season will have 9 in each episode. And so without further ado, let's get into it. Number 1. When Edward first arrived in 1919, he had his furnace railway tender and cab like all the other K2s. After the events of Edward and Gordon, Edward will receive a new cab and a Fowler tender in 1924 as a means of refurbishment. And you can still see these upgrades on Edward to this very day. Number 2. Little Barford is an 060 tank engine built in 2004 at Crovens Gate Works for the Ulfstead Castle Railway. The railway has a narrow gate section that runs within the castle grounds alongside their standing gauge lines. For a long time there were only two engines and they were Duke and Millie. The demand for a third narrow gauge engine was growing in the early 2000s. And so the UCO ordered a new engine similar to the, to the design of Peter Sam. The main difference being the lack of a Gizzo director funnel the wheel configuration, among other slight changes, you know. And little Barford was painted to a special purple livery and became an official member of the Ulfstead Castle Railway fleet in 2004. Number 3. So when the RMS Aquitania was withdrawn and sold for scrap in 1949, instead of being immediately scrapped, she was instead laid up by the scrap air for several years. And this state of being laid up lasted until 1963 when sold at auction. And this is when the RMS Aquitania became a floating hotel within the marina at Lower Cedary. And this is where she still stands today and remains a popular tourist attraction within the area. She would also receive a slight adjustment to her paint scheme as well. Pretty cool. Number 4. Neville was withdrawn from service in 1964 and was immediately bought by an anonymous collector. Following the Northwestern Railway and British Railway split in 1968, the collector donated Neville to the Northwestern. Neville was placed amongst the ranks of the NWR's goods engine roster and was officially stationed at Tidmouth. And this we can still see Neville to this very day. Number 5. Norman was built in 1987 by the Tidmouth Harbour Board. The THB at this time already owned Dennis since 1959, and by around the 80s, the workload had seemingly doubled. And so Norman will enter service in 1987 and is one of the two shunders at Tidmouth Harbour alongside his brother Dennis. Number 6. Bruno is a Sodor line caboose shipped to Sodor in 1937. The Northwestern Railway subsidiary known as Kildane Transport had rebranded itself for a little bit and was buying up older cabooses from the United States. Bruno will be one of these brake fans seen on trains going up and down the line from Peel Godred and beyond. In 1998, he was relocated to the Arlstead Tramway where he works alongside Sigrid. And this we can see Bruno today. Number 7. The events of the episode Henry in the Dark would take place in 1937. You see, there was a mix up within the paints used to repaint the engines, and Henry accidentally received a glow in the dark paint and didn't realize until later that night. Henry would eventually use this unique appearance and opportunity to scare the living hell out of Gordon, in which I'd say we all know how that went down. And so Tom Hatt actually found this pretty funny. He even allowed Henry to remain in his glowing paint livery for a little bit. And it would eventually be repainted in early 1938. Number 8. Bloomer was a special built member of his class of engine, having entered service in 1897. You see, the Netford and Olsted Railway was testing the viability of having a tender engine work on longer services on a Netford to Olsted route. The demand was very light, so they figured an older design wouldn't be the worst scenario in the world to have. And so the KNUR commissioned the LNWR's works to build one last member of their large Bloomer class of engines. Bloomer will fit into his role perfectly, having entered service in 1897, and it was repainted into the railway's first generation livery of a red base coat with gold and black trim. Very similar to the LMS livery, except those are very, very vibrant red. Very unique. In 1923, Bloomer was officially retired and became a static display at Corbin's Gate Station. And this lasted for about 50 years until 1973 when Sir Robert Norby II purchased Bloomer for his upcoming Ulfstead Castle Railway, which will open a year later. And he would finally enter service under the UCR in 1976. And this we can still see Bloomer today, 
Pawnee Kitchener Tourist Train. Number nine. Duncan of the Scarlet Rail will wear the ICKR's red livery for the majority of his working life. That was until he requested a change in 1976. This was when he will gain his iconic yellow gold livery seen in the TV series. Oh, he also has red side rods too. Pretty cool. In this, the livery you can still see in Duncan today. Thank you all very much for watching this first episode of Port of Lore I Blink Season 2. And I will see you all in the next one. And now, folks, it's time to say goodnight. We sincerely appreciate your patronage and hope we've succeeded in bringing you an enjoyable evening of entertainment. Please drive home carefully and come back again soon. Good night.